is the CBS Evening News with John Roberts. As the new school year begins, educators around the country are debating whether bilingual education is necessary. Voters in Arizona this year may follow those in California who have mandated English-only classes. Sandra Hughes has a report card on that program's progress. When school started in Oceanside, California this week, seven-year-old Christian Dominguez was eager and ready to begin classes. Don't tell me, okay? That's a big leap from last year when he couldn't speak a word of English. In just a few months, Christian mastered his new language in an English-only class. The program was mandated under Proposition 227, which virtually outlawed bilingual education in California two years ago. My friend Jonathan, he said, wow, you can speak good English. According to California standardized test scores, Christian isn't alone in his English-only success. Over the past two years, reading test scores for English learners has increased nine percentage points. Math scores are up 14. Absolute shock that I felt I had been wrong all of these years. For 30 years, Oceanside, California school superintendent Ken Noonan believed in bilingual education. But after the English-only law passed, he watched in amazement as students' test scores soared. None of the dire predictions came true. If anything, kids are coming to school more enthusiastic. They're soaking up the English much more quickly, especially in the younger grades. Though the test scores are startling, some question whether English immersion should be given all the credit. Class sizes have also been reduced and reading techniques improved during the same period of time. Not far from Oceanside, Oneana Elementary School officials work to keep bilingual education programs at their school. To do so, they had to become a charter school. Their bilingual students are doing just as well on the standardized tests as English-only students. Proof, they say, that it's too early to give up on bilingual education. Students who come to us in our school speaking a language other than English are going to be more successful if they participate in a bilingual program. Oblivious to the political debate that continues to rage over bilingual education, Christian Dominguez is practicing his English. He just started the second grade, and he has a lot to talk about. Sandra Hughes, CBS News, Oceanside, California. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, Going to school in English only, they said it wouldn't work. Going to school with a voucher, they said that wouldn't work either. We'll take a closer look. We're going to take a closer look tonight at two experiments in education, one on each coast of the country, each of which has produced its own deep, persistent controversy. Vouchers and bilingual education. Three years ago, Californians voted to end bilingual education and oblige children entering the school system to be taught in English only. A million and a half children, 80% of whom had spoken only Spanish. Now, the critics of this predicted that it would not work, that the children would be left behind. So we asked ABC's Judy Muller to give us a progress report. Come on. The man who led the drive to replace bilingual education with English-only instruction in California has a lot to smile about these days. We're talking about the fact that in less than two years, the average test score of over a million immigrant children in California went up by 40 percent. At Weems Elementary in the heart of Los Angeles, test scores on a state achievement exam rose in every grade in every subject. All right, manual. Claudia Blythe teaches second grade there. I am surprised. Yes, I am. I, I understood and believed in the philosophy of bilingual education, that it was going to make them truly bilingual. And I thought that was a good thing. She's also surprised that the cold turkey transition to English-only instruction was so smooth. She no longer has a Spanish-speaking assistant, so the kids are obliged to speak in English. I put my watch on my wrist a language most of them could not speak about. two years ago. How many of you speak Spanish at home? A lot of you. Today, these children are truly bilingual. I can co communicate with two languages. And they feel sorry for kids who can't. I have a friend 
Yes, he's in kindergarten, but his teacher talks in Spanish, and he doesn't know how to talk in English. Parents who still want their children taught under the bilingual method can request waivers from English-only instruction. But at Weems this year, not a single parent asked for a waiver. Our parents feel that the kids will be successful if they speak English. And um, they're 100% behind it. Despite the success of English-only instruction, educators are reluctant to give it all the credit for the higher scores. They point to factors unrelated to the change, such as better teacher training and smaller class sizes. And bilingual educators still believe their method can be highly effective. In a study that we conducted, we can see that, in fact, uh, our students in the bilingual programs are still showing that they're doing as well or better than kids in all English immersion. Even critics agree that a good bilingual program has a place for children who are struggling with language skills. As for the rapid success of English-only instruction, much of the credit really goes to the kids. I hope they get it right. After all, they're the ones confounding the critics. Judy Muller, ABC News, Los Angeles. Alan Combs, when California's Proposition 227 banned bilingual education in public schools two years ago, many educators expected the worst, fearing the state's one and a half million Spanish-speaking children would flounder when thrown into English-only classes. Instead, they flourished, and new standardized test results show that the student scores increased, sometimes by more than 50 percent. But critics contend it's too early to give Proposition 227 an A+. Plus. They credit other reforms, such as smaller classes, more funding uh, for the success of the students. So did Proposition 227 really make the grade, or will immigrant students suffer in the long run? Joining us, Ron Anzi, co-author of Proposition 227 and chairman of English for the Children in Washington, D.C., Angelo Amador, education policy analyst with the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Good to have you both with us. Uh, Mr. Amador, how do you dispute those statistics? Don't we see well, an increase can... in the way the kids are, how well they're doing? Well, the, the test scores did go up, but what they forget to mention is that the, actually the gap between the general number of students and the link Latino students have actually increased as opposed to decreased. What do you mean by in, the gap? What do you mean by that? Well, the gap is the scores. All of the scores went up. All the scores went up also for uh, right. students that were in bilingual education programs. But the gap between the general score, the average scores, and the scores of uh, limited English proficiency students, right. the, the score is there's a, a bigger gap. And Ron, there are all these other mostly. factors, smaller classes, more money being put into these classes, influx of money into the system, uh, th there's a shift to progressive phonics teaching in California. You can't discount those, those reasons for the increase Some in how well they're doing Some of those factors are well. very important, in particular yeah. phonics, getting rid of whole language, I think, right. played a huge role. On the other hand, all the theorists who support bilingual education also support whole language. So you thought both of those reforms are mistaken. Right. And also there are waivers. Some of these kids get waivers so they don't have to uh, do English only. So you don't, that's got to be factored in, which it really hasn't, right? And that's the most important factor because when you look at those students who stayed in bilingual programs, they're doing much, much worse. Their test scores increased minimally compared that, to the students. Hey, exactly Ron, right. first of all, they can't admit they're wrong. Because you know what? <laughs> there, there, there were those of us that supported you. You were on this program back in 98. Sure. I remember almost being accused of being racist by supporting Prop 227, all sorts of allegations. These kids will never learn. Actually, one, one thing that I want to mention yeah. is that they, there are there are scores in at least 10 schools that have a significant number of bilingual students that did better uh, than schools with uh, English-only students. But English Angelo, the, the, the study the study is very clear. These kids are flourishing. In spite of predictions of doom and gloom that were made on this very program just a couple of years ago, the critics, the pundits, all of them were wrong, and Ron well, was right the, because the, the results gap, are the staggering. Gap. Sir, I mean, this is overwhelming, the success we, we're not of English against immersion. In, we're not in against English immersion programs. Actually, as you were saying earlier on the previous segment, we're in favor of having choice. We, we think that the parents, the educators, well, who have choice of how to better educate children. This is something that, uh, that you just said yourself uh, Ron, less than 10 minutes but, ago. But the reason why I wasn't surprised is because we already had some information that, that we could go on prior to you putting 227 into full effect, the immersion uh, uh, proposal and effects, because the Labor Department had a study that showed that immigrants learn English more la rapidly under that environment when, they're less, but, when they use less of their native language around them. And, and so we already knew that it would work. It was just a matter of, you know, you taking well, actually, the heat. But, but it's Hang not on a working second, 
you okay. taking the heat for what was obviously you way ahead, you're helping these kids as we knew you would. You really deserve a lot of credit for taking a lot of uh, uh, heat for things knowing you would be right here. And it wasn't just that. I mean, look, throughout all of American history, immigrants have come to the United States and their children have learned yeah. English very easily. Furthermore, in California, the only group of immigrant children who were given the alleged benefits of bilingual education were Latino immigrant children. All the other groups were taught English, and by coincidence, all the other groups did better in school than Latino immigrants. We're going to give Ms. Amador a chance to respond in just a moment. We've got to take a quick break, Mr. Amador. You get a chance to respond when we get back. The debate continues. Please stay with us on Hannity and Combs. Welcome back to Hannity and Combs. I'm Sean Hannity. All right, Mr. Amador, uh, as I pointed out here, these students are flourishing in spite of these predictions of doom and gloom. Um, you want to still offer the kids choice, bilingual education as opposed to what is now clearly working, this immersion, English immersion. He's, he's, not, he's and, not clearly working. He's not clearly working. Uh, uh, we sir, think, sir, I can hold ahead. up. Students flourish under English immersion. They're flourishing. They are doing well. well this, they, it's already in. We've known that this is working. <laughs> no, actually, actually, there. Everybody, all of the test scores increased, also including those of uh, the students that were in bilingual. All right, but the, la the labor department in their study showed that this was the best way to do things. And my question to you, sir, is this: Lang English is the language of opportunity, success, prosperity in America. Why don't we just take a year? These kids that need it, and it's mandated by law that they get this this education this immersion, why don't we get these kids up to speed, we get them into the school system, we get that little hurdle out of the way. So then they, ne they never have to worry about it, and they can be fully acclimated we to believe, American We language. believe that English is very important. We believe English is the language of opportunity in the United States, and actually internationally as well. But another thing is that we don't want kids to fall behind. We want kids to have a well-rounded education most, would, in mathematics, in science, in, most, in year, any other right, subjects in the, in the language. At right, most, we're talking well. about a year. Well, well, what's interesting is there's actually one district where the students did fall behind in this last year. Their test right. scores, it's about the only district where the test scores went down rather than up for the immigrant students. Right. And that's VISTA, which kept but its kept bilingual, bilingual programs. programs. But, but, but again, but again there's, there's, ten, there there's ten schools with have a significant bilingual education program that did better in, in English, I, math, and science than in English and math. Well, how, how long did it take, immersion? How long? About a year, less about than a year. About a year, less than about a year. About, 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 about a year, he might not work, they might send them he, back. Right. He was making the point that test scores are up for even those students not in a bilingual education program. How do you account for that? Well, the thing is, again, there were a lot of good reforms in California, getting rid of whole language, right. shipping over to finance. And all these but other the reforms inter... could be equally responsible. Well, but the interesting thing is the test scores of the immigrant students rose more rapidly than those of the other students, and the immigrant That's test correct, scores... Actually, no, the immigrant... Actually, excuse me. Do you dispute that, Mr. Right. Amador? Excuse me. The immigrant test scores ro most ro rose most fact, rapidly in the correct. districts that got right. rid of bilingual, and they rose little, if at all, in the districts that kept Mr. bilingual. Mr. Amador, do you concur with that? The, the gap... No, definitely. Definitely not. I cannot because it's incorrect. The gap uh, increased in all grades in math and, and huh. English, in except for seventh and, and ninth grade. All of the other grades. Want to give uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ernst, we keep sure. hearing this issue about school choice and sure. the ability to choose. Uh, we, that's a big debate as well. Should a parent be able to choose whether he wants his kid or her kid in a bilingual? class or not? Should a parent have that choice? To some extent, yes, and that's in the initiative. What the initiative allows is, it says parents who want to place or keep their children in a bilingual program right. can apply for a waiver to do so. There are tens of thousands of children still in bilingual in California. In some cases, they've been pressured to be in it by right. the teachers and administrators, but by and large, the number of students in bilingual is down about 90%. But those kids have done better too, haven't they? No, they haven't. They have not done better? not done better. Mr. Amador? No, uh, again, the, all of the scores went up. The kids in bilingual education programs have in also gone up. They went down. The, waiver in the, the waivers that he's talking about, again, is an application for a waiver. That doesn't mean you obtain the, the you're granted the, the waiver to put your kid in the program that you as a parent want to place your child and in because you believe problem. it's a better that's program. That's the problem. In VISTA, which had a strong allegedly bilingual program, they granted thousands of waivers. And VISTA, which is the one district that tried most to keep it bilingual, their test scores went down last what year. What do you do with a child students. who's not learning, who's in an English-only program and still isn't getting it? What do you do then? Well, you keep them in the program a bit longer. And if it doesn't work, it's then maybe they can apply for a waiver. I, uh, Mr. Amador? Or, or, they or, drop out, or they drop out and we lost that child. And that's not what we want. We Test. want the child to move on. Mr. We want Amador, the child to have a well-rounded education. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Ernst. I'm going to give you credit. Congratulations. Hey, thanks a lot. Um, I, uh, you are on the cutting edge on this, and I give you a lot of credit for that. Stay tuned. We have more powerful debate tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for being with us tonight. We hope you'll join us tomorrow night. Thanks for being on board. Thank you.
You're watching KCET, infinitely more for Southern and Central California. Spencer Michaels and Gwen Eiffel look at the renewed debate over bilingual education in California. What happened when California rolled back bilingual education? Spencer Michaels begins our coverage. Two years after California voters decided to shut down most bilingual education classes, new test results have provoked a new debate. The scores show that some Spanish-speaking students have dramatically improved their English reading and other academic skills by as much as nine percentage points for second graders. Otra vez. What is the But state education officials say test results for all students are up and they say it is premature by several years to conclude that ending bilingual education has helped Spanish speakers. Still, the results are being hailed by those who led the drive for Proposition 227, the highly controversial measure that outlawed bilingual education in 1998. Today, many immigrants work long hours, yet barely earn enough to feed their children. Unless schools teach children to read and write English, they may be trapped in the same hard life. Vote yes on Proposition 227. The ballot measure, which passed with 61% of the vote, was designed to end classes where Spanish-speaking students were taught some subjects in Spanish, with more English used as they got older. That system kept test scores down and dropout rates high, according to Silicon Valley businessman Ron Unce, who wrote the ballot measure. The reason they're doing so badly is they don't learn how to read or write English properly in the schools, since the schools don't teach them English at a young age. The new law directed schools to place students with limited English proficiency into classes where English is the only language spoken, so-called English immersion. So I'm going to give you a hard one because you're the second graders. <laughs> um, measure, measure. Remember we measure how tall we are over there? Nearly half the nation's children who are not proficient in English live in California, about 1.4 million. So California's experience with eliminating Orange. bilingual okay, education was Measure. watched closely. Good. Great, that. Good job, Alta Gracia. Even after Proposition Gasto. 227 passed, Gasto. many educators Gasto. continued to argue Gasto that bilingual Gasto. education was much more effective than English immersion. They said if it were eliminated, test scores would drop even lower. Berkeley Superintendent Jack McLaughlin. Actually, there's overwhelming evidence throughout the nation that uh, teaching reading in the student's native language is definitely in the best interest of that student. But today, statewide, 90% of limited English students are in immersion classes. And the new test scores show those students have improved, especially in the early grades, where scores went up three to five points in reading and five to seven points in math over two years. So either way, these two pieces are going to make seven, right? Now what do I do? Skeptics, okay. including state education okay. officials, are not convinced. They say smaller classes and increased spending may account for the fact that the results for all students are up. They say it's too early to tell the true impact of English immersion, and they emphasize that even with the increases, the scores of non-English speakers remain abysmally low. They say the gap between English speakers and non-English speakers is as wide as ever. Glenn Eiffel takes it from there. So, is bilingual education dead? Joining us to discuss the California experience are two school superintendents who have witnessed it. Ken Noonan of the Oceanside School District, north of San Diego, helped create the California Association of Bilingual Educators 30 years ago. He now believes English immersion is working. Jack McLaughlin of the Berkeley School District, who we just met in Sp Spencer Michaels' piece, says students can still be best taught in their native language. Welcome, gentlemen. Mr. Noonan, when Proposition 227 passed two years ago, you were among those saying that this would be a step back. You've apparently changed your mind. I have, and that's been based on experience, two kinds. One is the test scores of our Spanish-speaking children, especially the primary grades, have dramatically risen. And the second is visiting classrooms over two years and asking children to read to me and explain to me what they've read indicate that 
children are learning to read, to read English, and read it well, much earlier than I ever thought they could. Why, why is it that you were opposed to it originally? I've been an advocate of bilingual education for a long time. I was a teacher in bilingual education and a manager and uh, helped form an association to support teachers. And that advocacy has uh, been strong, even though I suspected for a long time that there were some flaws that we were not fixing, such as the length of time that many children were spending, in our case, in Spanish instruction versus moving to English. Mr. McLaughlin, what has your experience been? Well, my experience has uh, been in, in Berkeley uh, School District, uh, working with uh, uh, students in uh, schools for over 27 years as a superintendent, and and really developing uh, techniques, uh, methodologies to uh, provide maximum achievement for all students. So it's not just limited to uh, uh, students that uh, don't speak English, but all students in all ways. But you don't think that an English immersion has been working? Oh, I, I'm really pleased. I, I'm, and I want to commend Ken for the great rise in test scores. That's fantastic. The whole state has pulled together through reforms, through the efforts of our teachers, uh, all working together to make education better for for, for everyone, uh, is, is, but as far as, you know, is it working? Yes, it is working, but so are many outstanding bilingual programs throughout the state. The, the test scores from the bilingual programs that we have uh, meet or exceed all those in the English immersion classes, so we're, and we're very proud of them too. So the test scores in Berkeley, have they reflected the same kind of improvement that they have in uh, Oceanside? Oh, well, actually our scores started out and, and are higher than those in Oceanside. Uh, for, for whatever reason, but uh, we, we have seen improvement and uh, we're looking for more. So what is uh, the point in bilingual education if English immersion works so well? No, the point is our goals are not only to have our children uh, speak English fluently, but also have access to the, uh, the learning curriculum from the first day of school. And at the end of the program, uh, as the program transitions into middle school, to not only be fluent in English, but fluent in a foreign language, Spanish in this case, be biliterate, bilingual, and uh, we, we feel that the citizens of today in this world need more than just one language. So uh, we're very proud of our program. It is successful, and uh, it works for us. So Mr. Noonan, is there any reason why bilingual education is still necessary if people who come to the school system already with different, a different language from their homes now are learning English in the schools? Why do the schools now have to teach bilingually anymore? Well, I think the issue is one that's flexibility to all, all districts in the state of California. Districts can pick their way to go through it. However, the new law, 227, clearly mandates that instruction be provided in English, uh, and almost overwhelmingly in English. We took that law and applied it very literally, and we've seen great success. Yes, there are other things that have gone on. Reducing class size in grades one and two in our district, also moving to a strong phonics program has helped all children in our district. All of our scores have gone up. But clearly, 227 uh, was catalytic. It was a catalyst for our district, at least, and showed us that these children could progress in English far earlier than uh, we had anticipated. So the worth of a program, such as bilingual education, becomes really something that's very personal, and I think something that each district has to examine. Mr. Newman, let's talk about these tests for a moment. We, we know there is always controversy about standardized tests. Are, we talk, are these tests an adequate measure about whether these students are actually learning English or whether they're just learning how to take tests? Well, I think they're adequate in the sense that they really do test the spectrum. It's reading, writing, and math, and it's science, and other subjects will be added. The tests are pretty comprehensive and fairly broad. Some people don't like norm tests, but I think this gives us a pretty clear measure. The tests are in English, so it's also a test of how well the children can understand the problem and provide a solution. How about that, Mr. McLaughlin? these tests? Uh, what, well, the tests are, are, again, a snapshot in time, and, and, and uh, we, we're just in our infancy in, in, in this high-stakes testing in California. Um, but, and it's shown, at least research I've seen, that, that as, as a new test is administered, the results do increase in the first few years as, as teachers now understand what is expected to be tested and, and, and the curriculums are aligned to that test, then yes, test results increase. Uh, uh, they do. So, but that is not the only measure. I mean, communities, as Ken said, should have the opportunity to choose the, the outcomes that they want. If, if reading English and, and, uh, and, and, and speaking English is the sole outcome, that's one thing. But if we want to go beyond that and, and talk about uh, reducing or eliminating the achievement gap or having students 
have access to more than one language, then that perhaps is another desire. Does, so, the, uh, does the current law allow that kind of flexibility, in your opinion? Oh, yes, it does. Uh, the, the current law does allow for waivers. Uh, there are many successful bilingual programs thriving in the state of California through the waiver process uh, that the parents are allowed to opt in, and they're doing very, very well. Um, I, I agree that with Ken that this was catalytic, and I commend UNS for doing this. It, it focused, it put the spotlight on a very severe need that we have uh, all, over the, all over the nation, and that in itself has energized us all to find solutions to this problem and that is in the best interest of all the students. How do we know that part of the solution wasn't the class size that Mr. Noonan mentioned or wasn't the phonics education that he me mentioned? How do you measure that against the English immersion program? No, I, and I think that's what the state officials are talking about, that it's really, really a little, little early to make a, a judgment that, yes, because of Proposition 227, uh, therefore, uh, you know, all the students are going to learn to speak English uh, uh, sooner, faster, and so forth. Uh, they're, they're saying we need time to study this, and that's what I'd recommend. It, it, it seems to be accelerating uh, uh, to a national issue, so maybe we ought to have a national study of this, similar to the, the Collier Thomas 14-year study on bilingual education that, that had some very significant results. Let's elevate this to a research level, not take tools out of teachers' hands that may be good for kids, and really come to some conclusions rather than make it a political football. How about that, Mr. Noonan? Is this something that can be measured on a national level, or is this something which can only be measured district to district, state to state. Doing it at a national level would be fine, but I think, and I agree with Jack, that needs to be done. However, I think the issue is that we're at a critical stage in California, probably in the nation. We need to move our children, our Latino children, into the English mainstream as quickly as possible because the language of success in this country is English. And unless we do that, these children will not see the success that others have. In our case, we have seen children moving from Spanish to English coming to almost grade level in reading within two years, uh, which used to take five to six years by teaching children to read first in Spanish and then in English. I think there is a space, a place for research, but we don't have time to wait. We need action. Our children must be brought into the English mainstream as quickly as we can do that. It sounds like you're saying that the traditional method of bilingual education, which is teaching children in lower grades in their own language and then eventually bringing them into English, should be set aside now in favor of this, this, this way of doing it in California. What I'm saying is people should not be afraid of it, that it works, it works well, and they should take a close look at it as something they should use in their district. How about that, Mr. McLaughlin? Is this something that Arizona and California, which now are taking this up next to, uh, in their own initiatives, is this something that they ought to act on based on the California experience? You know, I, 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 I still really have a problem with taking a tool out of the teacher's hand. It's like t telling an art teacher that that, that, that you can teach art, but you can't use the color red. You know, if, if in fact the ability to speak another language will help a student learn not only English, but, but the whole uh, learning curriculum, then why should we take that out of a teacher's hand? I can't think of another uh, teaching technique that has been eliminated uh, uh, by, by the voters. I don't know of another one. It's like in the uh, beginning of the century when you could only learn if you were right-handed. So all the left-handers were forced to, to, uh, to write right-handed. I mean, it's, it, it, it's very comparable to me. Why take a tool that can be used out of a teacher's hand, especially with the high-stakes accountability and testing we have? We're accountable for results. Why should it matter how we get to those results? Because we are held accountable to the results. And if we need to be teach bilingually, then allow us to teach bilingually. Mr. Noonan and Mr. McLaughlin, thank you very much. I imagine California, as usual, starting a national debate. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. On, on the legislative process. Issue 5. Habla Espanol. Voy a construir puentes, no paredes. Bienvenidos, la onda latina. Aquí. The presidential candidates are polishing up their Spanish to court the Hispanic vote. But in Arizona, some voters want to say adios to Spanish. A referendum to abolish bilingual education from the state schools will be on the Arizona ballot November 7th. Supporters of the measure hope to improve student performance. When California scrapped bilingual education two years ago, its students' standardized test scores went up. 
Interestingly, many who support the English-only measure are themselves Hispanic. They say Arizona's 30-year-old bilingual system is a sham. It leaves immigrant children with poor English skills and dooms them to educational and economic failure. But opponents view the banned bilingualism initiative as grossly unfair. They say bilingual education maintains students' native language skills and culture and keeps them on an even footing with English-speaking students because native tongues as well as English can become instruments of learning. Others see the anti-bilingual measure as anti-immigrant. What's the principal motivation behind this initiative effort to ban bilingual education? Eleanor Clift. Well, I think in the early 90s, when the Republican Party was on its war against immigrants, the anti-bilingual measures did convey a hostility towards the immigrant community. But I think if, if you look at this as an educational theory, kids do better if they're immersed in English. But these measures rip away all help and I think you want to be able to also give them some bilingual help and neither of the presidential candidates Bush or Gore favor ending bilingual education totally. Do you think this measure is anti-immigrant or is it pro-assimilation? I think it's pro-immigrant because it helps give Spanish-speaking immigrants a chance that people could, speaking other languages get because they don't get the bilingual to education. To master the language? To master the language, they be able to move up in society and not just work in garment sweatshops as their parents do and have other opportunities. Uh, I, I think that, I, I mean, I've covered this thing. I've been out in California. I covered Proposition 227, which passed in June 1998. Which provided what? Which provided, it's, it, it's a twin of this Arizona measure, sponsored by entrepreneur Ron Unz, who is a conservative Republican, but with support from Alice Callahan, who's a lib liberal left ex none who has What point a, were you moving that, on to? My point is that uh, I have been in the classrooms. It's working. The test scores are up. Kids are learning in English. I, you know, when you see somebody, a kid who, and in, in, you see him in June, who's being speaking reading fluently in English, who know, knew no English at the beginning of the school year, this can work. The other system held kids back and was but evil. My, but my, my bilingual education is not a single form of instruction. To make a flat declaration that it works or it doesn't work verges on the meaningless. We've had 30 well, look, years of look, experience. Tony, Tony, of it look, not look, let me hear from Tony. Look, look, quickly, by the way, the Republican Party was not anti-immigrants. They were anti-illegal anti immigrants. <laughs> but but, 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 politi but politic politically that didn't play, so <laughs> that they backed off of that. But there's no question, oh. on a policy basis, that uh, bilingual education we is all, damaging. We all agree that this ban on bilingual education in Arizona will pass, correct? Will yes. pass. Uh From Fifth Avenue, in the heart of New York City, it's Bryant Gumbel and Jane Clayson. This is The Early Show on CBS. And although all the official census figures won't be out until early next year, the fact is that in California, minorities are now in the majority. For the first time, whites account for less than 50% of that state's population. The growth rates that have made that a reality reflect trends that are now being seen nationwide. The number of Latinos and Asians has been growing rapidly everywhere, as evidenced by what's happening in Nevada the nation's fastest growing state. It's not just tourists who are crowding into Las Vegas. Many new arrivals are staying put. And in Nevada, those new arrivals are likely to be non-white because as the numbers suggest, U.S. growth rates have been most profound among Asians and Latinos. In the mid-80s, the Hispanic population here was about 5 or 6 percent, and now we have 79 percent of our population here at Hewitson is Hispanic. Hewitson Elementary was built to handle 600 students. It now has almost double that number, and many of the new students speak very little English. Buenos dias. Good morning. Okay. Fernando Prieto says there's an urgent need right now for teachers who can help bridge the language barrier. It's not so easy, but it's critical for the kids. In California, the growing Latino population spurred a backlash that saw several initiatives target immigrants and bilingual that education. Is a warning for us, Nevada will be able to uh, to learn from uh, California's experience. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. 
Yet despite widespread overcrowding in Las Vegas, the racial resentment that was seen in California still hasn't materialized in Nevada. Uh, we're now in the largest economic expansion on record, and, and uh, these are very favorable times uh, to assimilate the newcomers into our community. Congresswoman Ladora Sanchez is a prime example of California's changing demographic time. She's in Washington. Ms. Sanchez, good morning. Good morning, Brian. You represent a district that until a few years ago was very white, very conservative. How would you characterize its ethnic makeup today? Well, I think Orange County is certainly on the leading edge of what is happening in California and what will happen across the nation. And quite frankly, we not only have Hispanics, but we have so many different immigrant groups now, the largest Vietnamese American population outside of Vietnam, for example. And quite frankly, we're working very hard to ensure that we work on common themes in order mm -hmm. to uh, live together comfortably. And what kind of feelings have the changes engendered among your white constituents? Well, certainly there are those who have feared the changes. Uh, I think there was a lack of knowledge about the different groups, not only um, with respect to Anglos to the new minority groups, but also from the minority groups to the Anglos. And I know that one of the things we've done at all levels of government is try to bring people together and work together as well as different mm -hmm. faiths. Uh, you know, it goes, it goes beyond race or, or beyond look. It goes to different religious faiths. I mean, in the same place where you have the Crystal Cathedral and Garden Grove, you also have one of the largest mosques in the, sure. in the nation. And, me, a, and so it, it engenders all of the different aspects of living together. Let me ask you to sit tight for a second. With me here in New York is Ron Unz, the man who authored the California Initiative that did away with bilingual education. Mr. Unz, good morning. Great to be here. You've written about what you call the end of white America. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is exactly what's happened in California. In other words, whites are no longer a majority group in California. They're one of simply many minority groups. And those same trend lines are present in the United States overall. Is that a bad thing? Well, not necessarily. I think it depends how the country reacts to it. To the extent that we emphasize ethnic group politics, whites simply will become another ethnic group in a political bloc, and I think that could be a very dangerous thing. On the other hand, if we return to the tradition of assimilation and the melting pot, I think it could be a very positive development for America. Do you agree with that, Ms. Sanchez? Are we, are we looking at a, a melting pot, or are we looking at diversity and, and, uh, and ethnic grouping? Well, I would hope we're not looking at ethnic grouping. I mean, I myself come from uh, Mexican parents, and, and I would hope that people do not say Loretta Sanchez is a Mexican-American and that's all she is. Uh, and we work very hard in, in the political arena of Orange County to ensure that we're working on themes that go beyond and break down those ethnic barriers. That's not to say, however, that ethnic groups uh, shouldn't be allowed to keep with them some of the traditions, some of their language, some of the real culture, because they can very well share that with America, and that becomes a part of mainstream America. For example, We're, you know, it's not ketchup that's the number one condiment across the nation on, on tables. It's salsa. Mm -hmm. So there are very positive things happening Mr. in the Rose, U.S. Do you see whites losing some of the uh, privileges that are inherent in, in being a majority? Well, I don't really know if there have been that many privileges. In fact, I, I think on the whole issue of assimilation in the melting pot, Loretta Sanchez is a perfect example of that. For example, Sanchez is actually her maiden name. Her married name is Brixie, and her husband is an Anglo. And currently, the intermarriage rates among Asian and Latinos born in California are running about 30, 40, 50 percent. So I think the melting pot is a reality, and I think that's a good thing. So what do you say to those Americans who are well aware of, of the adage that as California goes, so goes the nation, and they look at these, these growing numbers and realize that, that pretty soon, uh, if you're white, you're going to be in a minority? Well, I think, again, it depends very much how the government reacts. For example, in the last 10 years, a lot of the ethnic battles in California have been caused, I think, by these demographic changes, and how the country reacts to these longer-term demographic changes in the nation overall, I think will determine the future of the United States. So I think it's a very important issue that we have to handle properly. All right. Ron Unz here in New York. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And, and Congresswoman Sanchez in, in Washington. Very much a pleasure. Thank you. You're watching San Diego's number one source for news. Right here, right now, this is News 8 at 5. Yes, back to school for students living in Oceanside, and today begins the third year that Spanish students 
Spanish speaking students are taught in English only. It's a successful program and the superintendent is getting the credit. North County reporter Shelley Rupus joins us live now with more. Shelley? Hi, Denise. All the students here in Oceanside are probably talking right now around the dinner table about their first day at school. But there is a buzz around the country, like you said, about the superintendent. He's become something of a superstar, at least in educational circles. He's been interviewed by Jim Lehrer on the News Hour, uh, Larry King, USA Today, The Washington Post, New York Times. It seems that everybody is very impressed with just how well the Spanish-speaking students here are doing in school. I, I was blown away by this. It's not just the instant fame he finds hard to believe. It's what the fame is for. You know, for 30 years, I thought the best way to do it was with bilingual education. Teach them first in Spanish, then around fourth grade. Get, get them into English only. But when California voters got their way with Prop 227 to teach all students overwhelmingly just in English, Ken Noonan complied completely. It is believed Oceanside School District embraced the new law more completely than any other in the state. It was rough at first. Many parents didn't like the new strict changes. It is hard. The first month is tough for these kids. You know, it's a new language and they struggle. And then they apparently learn quickly. Two years ago on the SAT-9, Oceanside's Spanish-speaking students tested 40 points below the national average. Tests just back show they're down now only 18 points. We believe that if they keep growing at this rate, in a year or two they'll be at or above the national average, which is remarkable. Word about the district's success is spreading, not just in the U.S., but abroad. We have recently got a call today, in fact, from Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, asking us about our program. Why? What do they want to know? Well, I think they're struggling with the same thing we're struggling with. They are having uh, immigration, especially from Eastern Europe, people who don't speak Danish. Now, Denise, as you know, there are still plenty of critics who aren't sold yet on the program. They say that California's smaller class sizes, especially here, and that more money altogether put, put toward education are what really made the difference. Now, Noonan says he agrees with that, but also says he will continue with this program full steam ahead. Denise? Thanks very much. Shelley Rupert is reporting for us live tonight from Oceanside. Now, this is 10 News Live at 6.30. Limited English-speaking students are also improving their test scores. And Oceanside school officials say that's evidence that English-only classes are working. 10 News reporter Leanne Kim is live in our North County Bureau at the North County Times with that story, Leanne. Well, Helen Kim, Oceanside students are preparing to go back to school tomorrow. More than 5,000 of them are limited English speakers. And that is the only language they'll be hearing from teachers in classes, which school officials say is good for education. Okay. Rocio Dominguez is learning English with her son. She feels that's what she must do to improve his education in Oceanside. I go into the class. I take his class English for help. Yeah, they help him. I like green balloons. Christian is considered a success story in the district's English-only program. Christian is blossoming. He's only been here a year. He's had nine months of education. He speaks English fluently. Just two years ago, Superintendent Ken Noonan opposed Proposition 227, which eliminated most bilingual classes. He feared second language kids would fail or drop out of school. Since then, we've seen that none of those dire predictions came true. Kids actually are doing well in school. Noonan says immersion students have doubled their test scores and they're learning English better and quicker. But some believe English-only classes violate their civil rights. Su problema era de, de que no entendía el inglés. Angel Hernandez says his eight-year-old daughter is suffering in the English-only program, both academically and emotionally. He's now part of a coalition of parents who filed a complaint with the federal government against the program. I think the Proposition 227 offers options who, who the one who is denying the rights is the district, the, the Oceanside district, it's not the, not the law. The law is very clear, we need not fear it, but the law says all children must be taught in English, overwhelmingly in English. We shouldn't fear that. Uh, as, as it turns out, these kids are doing very well. Kids like Christian actually look forward to school. I like orange balloons. I like Balloons. Very good! 
not bad for only studying English for nine months. Now, bilingual ed supporters point out that other districts, such as Vista and Escondido, which still do have some bilingual classes, also scored very well in their standardized testing. And Oceanside concedes there needs to be more research and studies done on the success of English immersion, and they do concede that it is very difficult on students, but they say that in the long run, that the grades speak for themselves. Live in the North County Bureau, I'm Leanne Kim, 10 News. Thanks, Leanne. You're watching San Diego's number one source for news. Right here, right now, this is News 8 at 4. Critics of bilingual education are now looking to San Diego County to prove their point. Uh, two years after California voted to end bilingual education, students who are not fluent in English have actually improved on test scores. But as News 8's Renee Sanchez reports now, some educators still say it's not that simple. Higher test scores have critics of bilingual education claiming victory. The ban on such education two years ago with California's Prop 227 was supposed to be a catastrophe by now. You won't find that in Oceanside, though. It's just amazing. The kids themselves are thrilled with it. Oceanside uh, Superintendent Ken Noonan campaigned, campaigned against Prop 227. Now he's a believer. I really did believe that it would be disastrous for kids. Now the second year, it's a continuing trend. We think it's positive. School districts across the country are watching Oceanside's test scores very carefully. The average reading score for Oceanside second graders who are not fluent in English jumped 19 percentage points over the last two years. Not so fast, say skeptics. All test scores have gone up for San Diego County students. They say it's premature to make the correlation between better test scores and an end to bilingual education. There are a few blips on the screen and people are taking those as uh, um, proof that this is occurring, but frankly, I believe that a lot of kids aren't even taking the test. Students can get a waiver to be taught in their native languages, and San Diego City Schools still offer biliteracy programs. What we hear from parents, at least at the schools where we still have biliteracy programs, is they want their students to learn English, but they like the idea of having them um, maintain some of their primary language and use that language to learn content area while they're learning English. The test scores haven't been broken down yet for students in biliteracy programs versus students immersed in English-only classes. Renee Sanchez, KFMB, News 8. Renee, thank you. An Oceanside superintendent says parents couldn't be happier. The next step is to make sure Spanish is still spoken in the home so students don't lose their native language. Tonight we have a new edge feature for you. We're calling it Power to the People. Every year during the election season there are issues that are too hot or simply too controversial for one person or political group to handle, so they are given to the people to vote so they can decide. Well, every Monday night Fox News Channel's Douglas Kennedy will examine one of those issues. And tonight he will take a look at bilingual education. Should your kids be taught English only? Thirteen-year-old Carla Corral spent a year in Arizona's bilingual education program. She emerged dazed and confused, unable to speak English with her mom. She'd wanted me to do it in English, but I wouldn't know how to do it in English because they only told me in Spanish. Carla's mother is a Mexican immigrant and wanted Carla to learn English, something she couldn't do in the Spanish-only classes. They are now part of a group trying to ban bilingual education in Arizona, a ballot initiative funded by controversial California millionaire Ron Unz. The reasons uh, that they are proposing this initiative uh, has to do uh, with things other than uh, their students being able to learn. Well, what are those things? We have some xenophobes uh, in this state and throughout this country that believe that English uh, is uh, the only language that is necessary. There are some who say that you are simply trying to get rid of a culture, that when you talk about English, you're getting rid of Spanish, you're getting rid of the Hispanic culture. Oh. That's not true. This is English for the, for the children. It means we want our children in the public schools to be taught English. That's what we're saying. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Grita Rosa, ven a prisa. Teaching Hispanic children in Spanish was meant to help them learn English faster. 
There are currently 93,000 students in Arizona's bilingual education program. A recent Department of Education study here indicates that only 2.8% flourish in English. They say this bilingual education program is not working. What's your response? Well, they're, they're, they're wrong, and they, they know that they are wrong. The, the, all the studies that have been done now, and there are several longitudinal studies, clearly indicate that when these programs are properly implemented, bilingual education works. If it was working, how come our scores are so low? Um, we've asked, you know, for proof that it's working. We're not against something that's working. Obviously, it's not because our kids are not making it. Two years ago, UNS funded and passed a similar proposal in California. By most accounts, it's been a success, with Hispanic students learning English faster. Still, some worry about the repercussions on Arizona's Hispanic community. It can be very divisive, and for uh, that reason, we don't think uh, that we ought to be considering a, an initiative of of this nature. A recent poll showed 70% of Arizona in favor of banning bilingual education. In November, the state will vote, deciding whether to send the program to the big adios. In Phoenix, Arizona, Douglas Kennedy, Fox News. So where do you stand on the issue? To help you decide, we have both sides of the debate. From San Francisco, the chairman of English for the Children and sponsor of Proposition 227 in California, Ron Unz. And from our D.C. Bureau, Brent Wilkes, the national executive director of the League of United Latin American Citizens. Good to see the two of you. Mr. Great Wilkes, to be here. You're, you're very welcome. Mr. Wilkes, what is your strongest argument in favor of bilingual education? I think the strongest argument is that it's an excellent educational uh, structure and technique that has proven to be very, very successful in certain circumstances, and we think it should be preserved and the students should be allowed to have the choice, along with their parents, of how they want to be taught English. Mr. Unz? If it worked, I would support it, but it's a miserable failure. In California, 95% of the children fail to learn English every year. Under the new system of 227, students are doing much better, and you can see it in the headlines. I Two think of the, the state's largest newspapers have clearly indicated it works tremendously well. Mr. Wells, what do you say about those results? Sure and, and on the heels of the results, Doug had this piece showing that uh, basically 2% of those kids in that Arizona program were speaking English after being in the bilingual ed program. Well, that's a fluent English, and I think that what you have to look at is that there's much stronger development um, overall. They say 5% per year is the average of people learning English. And, you know, we're talking about inner city uh, children, children that are at the lower socioeconomic scale. And so there are other factors that impede their educational progress besides just the bilingual education programs. I think they're very, very good programs, and they should be an option that educators and parents and teachers can use. All right, gentlemen, if you would, hold, hold your thoughts, because we're going to debate it on the other side of the break. And a little... Welcome back. Mr. Unz, one of the points that Douglas Kennedy's guest brought up in his piece, that he, he claims that, that your effort is not just about learning, but basically you have some xenophobes, as he called you all, in California, who are trying to wipe out other cultures other than American culture. I think that's very silly. The vast majority of immigrant parents want their children taught English in schools. What we're talking about is not English only, it's not official English. We're saying whether young immigrant children should or should not be taught English in the public schools. I think they should be taught English, and their parents agree. Also, well, out, of, uh, out of 15,000 uh, uh, parents in Arizona which are in the bilingual education program, only a handful, about 50, opted out of that program when given the choice. So not I don't given. see how... They are given the choice, and they opted not to leave the program, and this bill would force them not to, and it is a strange bill. It's not coming from Arizona. It's coming from California. Ron Unz is the only financial backer of this bill in Arizona, and I think that's a very telling fact. It's not an Arizona bill. Well, let me explain something. The people in Arizona are the ones who started this effort. I'm helping them along. They also have been talking to the press and bringing to the press's attention immigrant parents in Arizona who've sometimes spent years trying to get their children out of bilingual programs and have their children taught English instead, and the schools refuse. It's exactly well, the same as California. If, furthermore, if with regard... Uh, excuse me. Mr. Furthermore, Hans, with hang regard, on one second. Uh, Let Mr. Wilkes respond to that. Yeah, if this is simply a matter of choice, we'll support a bill that if UNS wants to make it an optional program for parents to choose into or choose out, 
we'll support that. That's that's what we're pushing for, parental choice. He's, his bill will force people into a specific methodology which is unproven and against the wishes of the parents that are currently in this program. So why would you force that on people? So would you, you buy into that idea of an optional program, Mr. Unz, or not? That's the thing. Our initiative is does provide the option. I, I guess now the head of LULAC has just endorsed our initiative because it no, allows... No, excuse I have not. Me, excuse me. It allows parents who wish to place their children or keep their children in a bilingual program to apply for a waiver to do so if there's any pr evidence that the program benefits the child's education. It allows the choice. The, the waiver provisions in this bill are even worse than the one that was in California. It's very difficult to receive a waiver. Right now, parents have the option to, to opt out of bilingual education if they want to, and that's a parental choice uh, program that's in place at the moment. There's no need for UNS to come into Arizona and try to push his divisive bill on the people of Arizona. Let me move on to another issue, and, and I want both of you to weigh on, uh, on this. Is there any proof that Hispanic students learn English any quicker in English-only classrooms? Mr. Wilkes. No there, no, there is not any proof. In fact, there are plenty of studies which show that the best English acquisition is a bilingual education program that lasts for many years because they learn English at a truer uh, rate by using their native language to understand what they're talking about. It's just common sense that you'll be able to pick up English faster than if you force them into an immersion program. Now, immersion does help with a little quick pickup in terms of casual English, but it's not going to last for a long a career in, in school, and that's what we're really focusing on, Ms. is how to best te teach uh, students in English for the long haul. Mr. Runs, I see you shaking your head. Uh, no, no, no. The facts are so different than that. First of all, the research he's talking about is funded by the bilingual education industry. The people who make well, their living from this, this program. Second of all, excuse the me. The guy with in, money in, is you, Mr. Runs. You're the one who's buying all these excuse studies. Me. Uh, excuse me. In California, we've seen the results of a million children who are not being taught English, now being taught English. And the San Jose Mercury News, one of the state's largest newspapers, which opposed the initiative, ended up spending months doing a statistical analysis of the results and found that after seven months of the new curriculum, immigrant students who stayed in schools that used bilingual education scored much lower than students who moved into 227 classes. The differences were 20 percent, 40 percent, even 100 percent improvement in test scores after less than one year. Mr. The Arizona program has a 97% failure rate in teaching English, and that's a failure. One last question for you, Mr. Unz, because uh, I, I, I saw Mr. Will shaking his head about this one. You, you brought up the, the compromised bilingual education money being pumped in this program. How is your money any different that's going from California into the Arizona program? Oh, I'm not saying there's anything. I, I oppose bilingual education. I think children should be taught English in schools. We're giving the children, we're giving the parents in Arizona, and we're giving the voters a chance to decide whether or not immigrant children should be taught English. Mr. Wilkes, I'm just you get the last the studies word. are biased. They're politicizing an educational issue. Educators, parents, teachers, those are the folks who should be making the decision, not Ron, Un Ron Unz from California trying to force his will on the people of Arizona. They need to reject this, this divisive proposition and tell him to go back to California. Well, gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. And clearly, a lot of voters in different parts of the country are going to have to make those same judgments. We appreciate uh, your educating us to both sides of the debate tonight. Well, as controversial as that might be, another controversy we've been following for years is bilingual education, and now you'll have a chance to decide what to do about that issue. Enough signatures have been gathered to put a proposition on the November ballot regarding bilingual ed. U of A graduate Maria Rodriguez is a product of bilingual education. She says her whole family has benefited from the process, and she claims that hanging on to Spanish gives people power and a voice. But Hector Ayala, who also came from Mexico and is now an English teacher, says 30 years of bilingual education has done little to help students. He thinks we should change things. In California, all we need to do is look at some of the statistics that are coming out from California uh, to realize that, yes, immersion does work. It is not an oppressive system, uh, and, and it is designed expressly uh, to do what bilingual education should have been doing all these years, which is to teach kids to speak English and to do academics in English. Broadcasting live for Dallas and Fort Worth, this is the news station, Fox 4 News at 9. When California voters voted to end bilingual education two years ago, opponents of the measure predicted non-English speaking students would suffer. Well, now the test scores are in and they're actually better than they were. We'll have the story coming up.
North Texas school districts cannot find enough teachers to teach kids in both English and Spanish. And you know what? Some new studies show kids who actually take English-only classes score better on tests than students with a bilingual education. Now, as Fox's John Dupree reports, some states are thinking about getting rid of bilingual ed, just like California did. One day in 1776, General George Washington came to visit. Most of the first graders at this Los Angeles school didn't speak English when they started kindergarten last year. Now they're thriving in an English-only classroom. Yes, and the scores show it. The latest California test scores show immigrant school kids are doing much better now that bilingual education is gone and all their classes are taught in English. For limited English kids, the mean scores for grades 2 through 6 went up dramatically, 39%. Second graders, often used as the benchmark for success, improved by 9% in reading, 14% in math statewide. So now, how many languages do you speak? Two. Matter of fact, you have equal access for these children. They are now getting the advantage of the teacher teaching them, not teaching assistants, not other persons. He only talks in English to you? Yeah. What does that do to help you? How does it help you? I learn more. He showed us how to read and talk loud and speak English. When Californians passed the English-only initiative in 1998, opponents predicted doom for non-English-speaking kids. Those opponents say the improved scores are misleading because California has also reduced class sizes and focused more on phonics. Kids in immersion programs in the early grades may be gaining verbal skills, but they aren't necessarily gaining the kind of literacy that they're going to need to be able to understand the academic subjects that are going to come down the pike. I think you can't take an objective look at what's happened in California and not say that 227 had a difference. There is another unexpected result. Teachers at schools such as this one, once divided between Hispanics and all others, are seeing children from different cultures beginning to play with each other. United now, they say, by a common language. In Los Angeles, John Dupree, Fox News. From KDBR's News and Technology Center, this is Fox 31 News at 9 o'clock. And is bilingual education the way to go in Colorado? Neighbors to our west say they have proof the answer is no. That story before 940. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. I'm Ron Zapolo. And I'm Libby Weaver. A proposal to ban bilingual education almost made it onto the Colorado ballot this fall. And now supporters have a little extra ammunition. Two years after California banned bilingual education and started English immersion programs, it seems the students' test scores have come up. For example, the second grade reading scores increased by nine percentage points. The math scores increased 14 percentage points. Fox 31's Kim Posey takes a look at the impact here. It's tonight's Spotlight on Education. Hola, mi nombre es Jorge. Hola, mi nombre es Miguel. Here at Columbian Elementary School in Denver, about one-sixth of the students are taught in bilingual education classes. Vicki Ann Romero has taught this class for nine years. She does teach the kids English, but academics are taught in Spanish, and she believes the three-year transitional program works. I teach first grade and I see that children learn quicker in their native language and then start to make the transition into English. Romero says she has a hard time believing that California's one-year English immersion program is completely responsible for the increase in test scores. I really need to see some proof, I guess. But English immersion supporters say the proof is the test scores. It showed me that it does work. We know it works. Dentist Efren Martinez tried to get English immersion put onto Colorado's ballot this fall. He says he'll try again. In uh, 2004, we're going to try to get it on the ballot. And, and we want it to pass because California has shown what it can do. In the next four years, these children will show what they can do. And it could determine if bilingual education survives. Kim Posey, Fox 31 News. Well, the bilingual education issue will not be on the Colorado ballot this fall because the state Supreme Court decided the wording was unclear and misleading. Voters in Arizona will face a vote on banning bilingual education this fall. This is the News Leader, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. 
There's a new study that may increase the debate over bilingual education in public schools. The idea is to quickly mainstream students into English-speaking classrooms. But after three years of bilingual education, many simply are not ready. Celeste Ford is here with this story. Celeste? Diana, until now, the Board of Education didn't have a real sense of how quickly immigrant children are lear learning English. It spent seven years studying the issue and today issued this thick report. It says only half the students test out of the remedial programs within the recommended time frame of three years. 16% of city students are English language learners. The Board of Ed report says the younger they are, the better their outlook, with two-thirds of kindergarten students mastering the language within three years. But if they haven't learned English by middle school, they're not likely to graduate. This principal says she's not surprised. Language acquisition is a long-term process. It's uh, five to seven years before a child can learn ac his academics in a, in a new language. But some of the new findings are disturbing by any measure. Among first graders, 22% remained in specialized classes after eight years. When looking at sixth graders, 55% were still in the classes after seven years. The report does not address immersion. That's the controversial crash course approach to English. A recent report says it's getting results in California, raising questions about its potential here. It has been around for many, many years. However, how much time are you dedicating to immersion? And how much are you excluding from the curriculum as you immerse the children? Right now, her students are placed in English as a second language, which offers remedial help or bilingual classes, with English phased in gradually. The report says each is effective unless students are switched back and forth. This education advocate says that happens all the time. You wouldn't take uh, children and teach them the old math one year and the new math the next and expect them to thrive in math. It's the same issue. There are a number of reasons English language learners are shuttled around, including parental choice. Schools Chancellor Harold Levy just ordered his superintendents to stop this practice. The report also called for extra services in the middle and high schools so these kids can meet the new graduation requirements. They have to take the region's exams. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much, Celeste. Okay. Good evening. I'm Richard French, and this is The Big Story. America was founded on the principle of equality for everyone, including a solid educational foundation for every child. Bilingual education programs were established in the 1960s to make sure that immigrants did not get left behind academically. But studies now are coming out that show that these bilingual classes are not as successful as once thought. Tonight, we want to know if you think the bilingual education system is detrimental to the learning progress of non-native speakers, or do you think a slower immersion into the English language is a better way for children to assimilate into the American culture? Welcome back. Tonight, we are talking about the bilingual education system in America. Two years ago, California voters decided to end bilingual classes and immigrant children test scores are on the rise, confounding many experts. Parents, as well as educators now across the nation, are beginning to question the effectiveness of native language instruction. Tonight, we want to know how you feel about bilingual education. You can give us a call if you haven't already, 888-RNN-CHAT. We'll open up some extra phone lines. We want to hear what you have to say. Well, this is taking place certainly in California right now. It is more than being proposed right now on the national level. Certainly in New York, many, uh, many people have been posed the question, do you think it should be eliminated in New York? And certainly New Jersey and Connecticut will not be far behind. Behind. We want to welcome our guest to the program here tonight in just a second, but first let's take a look at the history of this very controversial education system in our country. And between 1920 and 1960, there was English immersion, and is popularly called the sink or swim policy. Changed in 1968. In 68, Bilingual Education Act recognized the educational disadvantage that were faced by non-English speaking students. And in 1963, going be back a little bit, success of bilingual program for Cuban refugees in Florida inspired similar programs. Um, it was 
Fast forward here a little bit. In 74, Congress passed the Equal Educational Opportunity Act, ruling that identical education does not constitute equal education. What this really meant, quite simply, was, you know what? Just because it's uh, equal education, you've got to provide here different languages, and you have to give these ch kids the equal chances. In 67, Governor Ronald Reagan here, remember, obviously Republican governor, he signed the bill eliminating English-only instructional mandate. And in 98, under Proposition 227, moving forward, 1.4 million students are mainstreamed into classes after one year of English instruction. Interesting to note here, Republican governor in California at the time, this was very popular in the 60s here, this was something that would basically equal out the playing field. And if you also know, we are now in the age where we're reanalyzing a lot of these beliefs. Welfare was reformed here. Most people look back and say it was a success. Now the issue of bilingual education. Should it be left as it is, or should we change it? California, we're going to be talking about successes and or failures of ending the bilingual educational system and get to your phone calls in just a second. I want to now welcome our guest, and we are now joined by the co-author of Proposition 227 and the chairman of English for Children, Ron Unz, who you saw in that piece earlier. In addition to Mr. Unz, we're also joined by the director of the Education and Child Welfare Program for the Reason Public Policy Institute, Lisa Snell, who joins us on the phone line. Thank you both of you for joining me this evening. You're Great welcome. to be here. Uh, it's an interesting debate, and I guess uh, as we're sitting here in 2000, if we went back in 96, 97 to have this debate, I guess, Mr. Unz, you would have been labeled as uh, pretty uh, arch-conservative here without the consideration of the children uh, in mind. Now that you see some of the results that have come out of California, do you feel vindicated in any way? Well, yeah, I, I think I feel vindicated, and I think the vast majority of Californians who voted for the measure also feel vindicated. I really think there never was much support for native language instruction among any groups in the broad public. And it was kept in place simply because a very small number of people worked in the bilingual education industry and wanted to keep the program going. Lisa, let me ask you, were you surprised by some of the results, and these were uh, taken by nonpartisan groups here, as to how these children have performed in the last couple of years out of California uh, since it was basically put in a sink or swim policy after a year of transition? No, not surprised at all. In fact, um, smaller pilot programs indicate that when children are immersed in English only, that their test scores tend to go up. So there were other, even before Proposition 227, there were obviously other research that indicated that um, that program worked well for immigrant children. So let me ask you, Lisa, do you think that there still is a role here for a bilingual education, or do you think the system needs to be changed uh, and modified? We see, obviously, what happened in California. It's been discussed that in, in New York and other states here, uh, they could soon be following the lead of California. Should it stay as status quo, or should it be changed? Well, I think one of the things that needs to be changed is, in general, the idea that school districts are mandated to have a specific program. And in many cases with bilingual education in New York and certainly the way it was before in um, California, bilingual education was the only way. And so there was only one choice. And um, I think that's what needs to be changed where there's mandates. Now, most of the evidence points to the fact that bilingual education doesn't work. And I think certainly what's happened in California and also the other study that was recently re released in New York supports the idea that students that are taught in English, whether it's English immersion or English as a second language classes that aren't bilingual, tend to be performing better. So I think as a national trend, we tend to see people replicate programs that work, and so um, mm. moving away from bilingual education will probably happen. But do you still feel there is a role here for bilingual education, or do you think that it should be strictly an immersion type of educational system? Well, I don't think that you can mandate and make everyone everywhere have to go to an English-only program at the state level. I mean, I think that there has to be room for some local decision-making, but on the other hand, most bilingual education programs are state mandates. And certainly when you have the initiative process, the people themselves are mandating their choice on what they think works. 
Ron, let me bring you back into this. Uh, if you asked me a couple of years ago, I probably would have been one of the people who said it's not fair to the kids here to uh, pull the rug out from under them and force them to learn a system. They're going to get turned off by the educational system. They won't really be on the same footing, obviously, as the kids who've spoken English uh, their whole lives here, and they're going to be turned off and probably increase the dropout rates. Uh, I've changed my opinion a little bit with these uh, studies, but is it fair to just look at the black and white numbers? Some people say class sizes have been uh, decreased, and uh, there's a lot of factors that go into the performance of these kids in California, and it can't just be labeled that it uh, is all immersion into the classroom. I'd be the last one to claim that Proposition 227 is the only reason the test scores moved up so rapidly. Now, actually, class size reduction was not a significant factor. In fact, there were studies showing the impact of class size reduction was probably only about 5% or 10% of the improvement in test scores. In other words, it was a fairly negligible factor. The other large factor besides the switch to English immersion was getting rid of whole language and switching over to phonics because whole language just doesn't work very well and phonics works much better. The ironic thing about it is all the supporters of bilingual education are also supporters of whole language. So they were opposed to both of those changes and I think they were proven wrong on both grounds. But I really do believe that certainly the increase in test scores was, uh, may, was in very significant part caused by eliminating bilingual education. And one sign of it is those school districts in California that tried to keep their bilingual programs showed minimal improvement in test scores. And those that most completely eliminated bilingual education, notably Oceanside down near San Diego, districts like that doubled their test scores in less than two years, which is quite remarkable. Now, let me ask you, one of the uh, byproducts of going to an immersion program here uh, is the reduction in terms of cost that has to go in. You're obviously going to cut down on all of the uh, separate classes that have to go into place here for bilingual education. And uh, in some reports, it's a third of the cost if you had bilingual education. Do you suggest here that that money, that savings, be poured back into the schools in terms of uh, additional tutoring here, additional after-school programs, so when the kids find, as they will in all cases, in that first six months, that roadblock, they're helped and encouraged to stay into it, or do you think the savings should be passed on to uh, the taxpayers? Well, first of all, there isn't really that large a savings. In other words, different studies have come to different conclusions. But uh, remember, the students in a bilingual classroom are being taught, in a sense, in a similar classroom to a non-bilingual or non-Spanish oriented classroom. Now the books are a little bit more expensive and sometimes they have to pay the teachers a little bit more, but the cost saving is not that gigantic. And in fact our initiative, Proposition 227, required that the extra money be spent still on those same students, in other words the immigrant students who don't know English very well, and simply used to improve the program or provide, for example, slightly smaller class size or slightly better materials. But again, the cost savings are not that dramatic. I, I mean, that is not the best, best reason to oppose bilingual education, that it costs a huge amount of extra money. The best reason to oppose it is it just doesn't really work compared with English immersion. Uh, one of the, at least to me, one of the most startling numbers uh, that came out in the polls was one of the groups that uh, is the strongest proponent of immersion are the immigrants themselves. In fact, we're putting up a number that came through from the public agenda that 75% of recent immigrants oppose bilingual education here. And uh, I, I guess the feelings was, was that uh, they want the next generation to do better, right? Absolutely. In other words, many immigrant parents know perfectly well that if they knew English a little bit better, if they could read and write English better, they could get a much better job in our society. And they certainly want the children their children to be taught English as much as possible by the schools. In fact, Proposition 227 originally began when I read a series of articles in Los Angeles Times about a group of immigrant parents in downtown Los Angeles, Latino garment workers, who actually had to start a public boycott of their own local elementary school because it refused to teach their children English. And when a system has reached the point where parents have to carry picket signs because a school refuses to allow their children to learn English, I felt something had to be done about it. All the national polls have shown that the vast, vast majority of immigrant parents oppose native language instruction and want their children taught English as quickly as possible. In fact, one of the parts of 227 that also is very helpful in California is that it takes some of the money saved by eliminating bilingual education and puts it into funding for adult English literacy programs so that, for example, some of the parents of those children 
can learn English as well. And that way, when the parents and children are both learning English, they can help each other. Now, uh, obviously, we, uh, everyone's touting on both sides the success of uh, the program in California. Uh, it's been more than rumored, and in fact, you're on record as saying that this should be taken nationwide. Have you, uh, how about New York here, specifically? I know you talked about uh, how the city uh, political structure works. It, it would be pretty difficult for it to pass through New York, right? Right. Now, uh, actually, I've helped already a group of people in Arizona, parents and teachers and community activists, put a similar initiative on the ballot, which they'll be voting on in just a few mm -hmm. weeks, and I think it'll win. I really think it would be tremendously beneficial to try to do something about the failed bilingual programs in New York, and I'm very pessimistic about the state legislature taking any action on this, because the bilingual teachers and the bilingual administrators and the bilingual coordinators and the bilingual academics tend to have a stranglehold on the political process. On the other hand, I do think while mm -hmm. it's difficult to put something on the ballot in New York City dealing with this issue, I think it definitely might be worth mm -hmm. the effort. And I've already been talking with a few people in New York about possibly working with them mm -hmm. to move something like this forward, which I think would be tremendously beneficial. Issue. And now, Michael Krasny. Good evening and welcome to Take Issue. I'm Michael Krasny. It's been two years since Californians passed Proposition 227 that called for an end to bilingual education and the beginning of English-only classes. Even after it passed, the debate lived on and has spread to other states like Arizona and Colorado who are also considering ending bilingual education. But when this year's California test results came in, it proved that the English-only classes actually seemed to help those students with limited English language skills obtain higher scores. Younger children especially seemed to benefit from new programs that focused on reading and other subjects. KRON's Carl Sunken reports on one South Bay school's results. Well, first of all, we had to kind of train them to like the ball. While the Tex robot dogs were putting on a show for vacationing school kids, a group of school administrators were touring the place, holding a meeting there, and pleased with their test scores. Our students, uh, English learner students, have done well on the Stanford night. Pat Stellwagens with San Jose's Berryessa School District. What else can you use, Christina? Data released today shows Berryessa and many districts statewide increased their test scores for students whose English is limited. We have made sure that they have to write, listen, speak, and read English. While school may have been far from the minds of kids at the Tech today, the Berryessa school officials were strategizing for the next round of exams. We want to make sure that our teachers are getting more skilled in the classrooms. We have multiple assessments. That certainly helped the scores in Berryessa this year and other districts. For example, East Palo Alto second graders at one school showed a big score jump from last year in both reading and math, both for English-speaking students and English learners. And in San Jose's Alum Rock District, the score increases for English learners were actually higher. Berryessa principal Carol Marr credited extra teachers. And what they did was they spent an hour to hour and 15 minutes on really small group instruction on building those language skills. That costs districts extra money, but one in four California school kids have limited English ability, and two years ago the voters outlawed bilingual education. Experts say it's too early to say if that's making any difference in the test scores. Despite Proposition 227, bilingual education still exists in the San Jose Unified District thanks to a court order. And the star scores there didn't bode well for at least one school, Almaden Elementary. The second grade showed dramatic score drops in both reading and math for both English speakers and non-English speakers as well. Have English-only classes really worked, or are teachers merely teaching to the test? And how are children affected in the long term by English-only classes? And do children lose part of their culture by taking English-only classes. Join our discussion with your thoughts at 1-800-94-BAY-TV or on the internet at baytv.com and click on the Take Issue queue. With me now to talk about this are people on either side of the issue. Ruben Rosales is chair of the legal subcommittee for the Pro-Education Committee, which is for bilingual education. He's from Pittsburgh. And next to him is Silicon Valley businessman Ron Unz, author of Prop 2227 and advocate of English immersion classes. Welcome to both of you. 
Well, Ron Ins, let's begin with you. How do we know from these results that, number one, it isn't just teaching to the test, as some are claiming, or for that matter, the fact that you've got smaller classes, that you've got phonics teaching, that you've got more teacher training, all those factors may be really integral more than just the fact that we're doing immersion. Absolutely. There are a lot of separate factors involved here, but we should remember during the 227 campaign a couple of years ago, the supporters of bilingual education tended not to defend bilingual programs, which they admitted had a lot of problems, but they claimed if the initiative passed and were implemented, the result would be a disaster. There would be a plummet in student test scores for immigrant students. Instead, in the last two years, immigrant test scores in California have gone up by an average of 40%. Furthermore, the test scores have gone up the most in those districts which have most strictly followed the initiative, and they've gone up the least in those districts which have tried to keep their bilingual programs. Let me so follow through on that uh, point that you just make, because Ruben Rosales, you've got this sense that there's, there's a lot of crowing from, from people in Mr. Runza's camp. I mean, saying, you guys were all doomsayers. You were, I don't know if you were one of them, but, you know, there was a lot of talk of catastrophe. You know, the, the whole chicken little thing, if, uh, if 227 passed, then you've got higher test scores. You can't argue with that. Well, I, mean, I think that's only an indication of what has happened in certain areas, and I'd like to see a statewide assessment. And let's see, at all these schools, and the district that I represent, which is Pittsburgh School, where the, schools, the scores did not go up, in fact, a crisis has hit where we had investigations from the state and federal government on the implementation of 227 and we have kids that have been retained. Parents have no access to the school system and what's going on, waivers, in non-existent. So you want so a systemic study, which is exactly what Delaney exactly. Easton says. Exactly. I'm not she convinced wants. that, you know, a school down in Oceanside is reflective of what's happening statewide. And I really would like to see an assessment because I got a clear example of the, the hometown I'm in, clear violations of civil rights of these students. In the All right, you mentioned way. Oceanside. I want to get to what you see as violations of civil rights, but uh, I was saying to Ron Unz before we went on the air, that's the, you've got this guy Noonan down there, he's the poster boy now. Uh, I mean, because he was opposed for what, 20 years? Longer than that? 30 years. 30 years, <laughs> right. Opposed to, to uh, doing anything to dismantle bilingual education, he's become a convert. Absolutely. It, it really is a fascinating story. He was the co-founder of the California Association of Bilingual Educators. He was a bilingual education teacher, a bilingual administrator. For 30 years, he supported bilingual education. He opposed Proposition 27, vehemently opposed it. But when it passed, he's the superintendent of Oceanside. He said, the law is the law. The law has to be obeyed. And of all the school districts in California, both the supporters of 227 and the opponents agreed that he had the strictest and most complete interpretation of 227. Complete English-only classes, completely <coughs> eliminated all bilingual programs in Oceanside. There were a lot of protests against him, a lot of criticism. But the bottom line is at the end of less than two years, the test scores of all of his immigrant students have doubled. They have doubled indeed, Ruben Rosales. You see this as an aberration or something not to really uh, reflect the overall picture? I, I wouldn't put all our, you know, our efforts into this, these sheer numbers. I think, again, you know, statewide you'll find that things are different. And like I said, you know, you have certain, you, even here in the East Bay, you have schools that have done poorly trying to follow the, the law to the strictest rule. And the thing is, this is actually an, an in indication of bad law. You have a law that where districts were left to try and interpret it, and a lot of them were left trying to implement something they thought was right. Well, you spoke before of civil rights uh, violations. What do you mean specifically? And, and that's where I'm getting at, that Pittsburgh decided to dismantle their bilingual program, thinking that that was what they're supposed to do legally, and they didn't replace it with any services. And to compare that to Oceanside, where they probably had a superintendent, who was very supportive of services for the kid, minimal services for the students, and probably implemented some things. Pittsburgh did not do so. They dismantled it, farmed the kids out to classrooms, didn't provide them with any services. Even as early as last week, I met with a parent, a parent saying that our, my kid is being taught by another kid. The kid is teaching and interpreting for my kid. There's no program in place. But that's always been a problem with, with bilingual education, the state. You haven't had the personnel. You haven't had the faculty. You haven't had the training. Exactly. See, that's, and actually, you know, if I can quote uh, former assemblyman Bob Campbell, who met with me in a youth group that I, that I run, uh, you know, he did a focus group throughout the state, and what he found is that bilingual programs were effective and worked when they had support. They had administrative support. They had financial support. The ones that didn't work were the ones that did not have that support. Well, what are you going to do, Ron Unz, about these kids who are left behind? Because you do have kids who are being left behind, according to Mr. Rosales, and probably that's indeed the case. Th that's perfectly possible. Now, the truth is California is a very large state, and I don't know the details of this particular Pittsburgh school district, and it could very well be they're doing a poor job of implementing the initiative. In fact, the initiative specifically requires that children who don't know English be placed in sheltered English immersion classes 
to teach them English as quickly as possible. If they're not this getting... This is the waivers? Uh, the no, no, just the regular program. Just the regular program. The regular right. program sheltered English immersion. If the st immigrant students in Pittsburgh are not receiving such sheltered English immersion, then that's a violation of the law, and Pittsburgh you know, should be held accountable. What I think, though, probably both of us should be able to agree on is that Ken Noonan's district down in Oceanside has done a fantastic job. They've doubled their test scores. The immigrant students down there two years ago were far below average for the state for immigrant students. Now they're far above average. And I think other districts up and down the state should be able to learn from Oceanside, learn from the combination of English immersion classes, administrative support, and the services that you're talking about. We've got to go to a break, but full immersion right now in California is only, what, 5%, is that correct? 5%? For, as far as full immersion, according to the letter of the law of what we mean by immersion now? Oh, I think it's maybe more like 20%. Isn't Isn't that that high? A lot of school districts have been dragging their heels in following the initiative and keeping their bilingual programs, keeping halfway disorganized programs. The truth is, a lot of districts are disorganized, and no matter what the law is, they'll many times do a relatively poor job of implementing it. But those districts which have kept their bilingual programs, the most, have done the worst. All right, I'll ask the question pattern. of our viewers. Do you think that this program is indeed a success judging by the test scores, or should we just judge by the test scores at this point? Is it too premature and early to make that kind of a conclusive decision about bilingual education, that indeed it's supposedly, well, bringing the test scores up because it's no longer a part of the curriculum. Uh, I mean, it's a part of the curriculum in some cases, but not across the board. Let's hear from you. 1-800-94-BAY-TV. We invite your calls, and we'll continue after these brief messages ahead. There's a quote from Ken Noonan, the superintendent we were talking about from Oceanside Unified School District. I thought bilingual education would be harmful, but I was wrong. The kids have taken to English and are absorbing it like sponges. And this is a guy who, as Ron Ons told you, 30 years ago was on the ground floor of promoting and advocating and being really um, very strongly and passionately in favor of bilingual education. He didn't like 227 and he didn't like the changes that it was going to bring. So let's find out what you think. Bob from Santa Clara, let's bring you in the discussion. Hi. Bob, are you there? Yes, I am. Yeah, welcome. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I'm thinking that they, they should put more money into schools. You know, break down and have the bilingual kids learn on computers where they can uh, learn the, the subject that they're working on, and then they can learn English after discuss the, the problems. You mean you'd like to see the new technology foster bilingual understanding or sure, more for, bicultural stuff, yeah? Right. And you know, also, whatever class, if you have mathematics, it could be taught in, in every language, whatever kid... The, that's what they should learn it. Well, let me ask uh, Ruben Rosales, is that one way to restore perhaps uh, a movement? Because the movement is definitely away from bilingual education. Is this a, a movement back toward perhaps? Well, I mean, in terms of uh, his comment of whether doing high-tech teaching would, would be the key, uh, I, again, I'm going back to the basics of just the pure what's happening in the classroom right now in a lot of communities here in California. And because they're trying to interpret this, these kids are not getting services. So if we can just go back to having them taught by teachers that are qualified, taught by teachers with the skills to teach them and not have kids teaching them, uh, then I think that's a key thing. And it's, I don't blame the teachers, believe me. It's administrators that are trying to interpret this whole 227 thing. And Paul Samuelson says students do more when they're asked to do more. Students will perform more when they're asked to perform more. So if you make students learn English the way, say, it used to be done generations ago when people came here from Eastern Europe or from Asia, aren't you saying... You know, you have to come up to the standard, and that's all there is to it, and they'll do more? Well, I wouldn't interpret bilingual education as an effort for them to do less. I think that, uh, with, again, a bilingual program that is fully funded and that is supported by the administration will be asking kids to do more because they're asked to do things in two languages, and they're asking them to bring, bring them up to grade level. But at the same time, you're saying to them, we're going to give you this help until you really feel comfortable with the English language. I mean, that's really what it was designed well, to do. Well, I believe. think by law, they're guaranteed equal access to education, and that's all part of our case, is that their civil rights have been violated, they're not getting equal access to education. So is it a civil rights violation, or, is it, or does it become sort of an entitlement? Ron Unz, what do you think? Well, I, I think it became what might be called an entitlement. I mean, the truth is, the people who set up bilingual education 30 years ago, including Ken Noonan, for example, had the best of intentions. They believed sincerely that it would improve the education of immigrant children, it would help them, and it just didn't work. I mean, there are many times theories that sound good, but they don't work in practice. The problem is, by the time the evidence started building up that it didn't work, there was a huge entrenched bilingual education industry 
There were all the bilingual teachers and bilingual administrators. Well, let me get you back to What was the real demonstrative or, in your mind, uh, particularly dramatic evidence? Because certainly there's anecdotal evidence to the contrary. When you talk to young people who say, because of bilingual education, I, I got the education that I really well, merited. Here's one piece of evidence. There are 140 different immigrant language groups in California. In other words, children speak 140 different languages when they start school. The only group of immigrant children that received large quantities of this allegedly beneficial bilingual education system were Spanish-speaking immigrant children. All the others were tended to be immersed in English. And of all the immigrant groups in California, Spanish-speaking children did the worst in school. They had the highest dropout rates and the lowest test scores and the lowest rate of admissions to college. So in other words, that seems to be an indication that bilingual certainly wasn't helping. And the fact that their test scores now have risen so much once we got rid of bilingual education, I think is a sign it was dragging down Hispanic students for all those years. You uh, agree with that, Ruben Rosales? No? Uh, well, I'm a product of bilingual ed. I'm a <laughs> yeah. product of bilingual ed in Pittsburgh, where it was effective at one time. It was fully supported by its administration. You know, I have my college degree. I'm an, I'm an administrator with the Federal Department of Labor. Um, I could, I'm a clear living example that it can work, and it has worked for many people. Of course, one of the arguments you hear about the, the uh, appallingly low statistic of uh, Hispanic uh, graduates from high school is sometimes culture, sometimes you know, oh, the fact that they variables. need to work you know, and go to labor. And, exactly. Uh, there's several variables. Bunning the is would be not the one variable I would hang my hat on if I'm going to make that argument. There are several variables, and if you know the community, you know that there's several issues that they have to deal with and why th that happens. And so you, know, you have to keep in mind that, you know, the, again, this law implemented statewide. There's all kinds of things happening statewide. But what about what Ron Adams was saying, that you created a whole industry? I mean, that was why the people of California probably went the way they did on 227. They saw this whole bureaucracy and industry of bio... And as you, as you conceded yourself, you didn't really have that many well-trained teachers as you needed to boot. So you had, in other words, something that was failing, at least from all appearances. Well, when I say not enough teachers, isn't that what happened in our case? Is not that properly trained teachers. Yeah. Right. When I say that, I'm saying that what happened in the school is they farmed the kids out to all classrooms. So you're not going to have the CLAD or B-CLAD certified teachers as required by law in every single classroom in the district. And that's what happened in Pittsburgh. They farmed them out to all classrooms. Whereas in the bilingual program, they were put into classrooms where they had enough staff and the staff was there to support it. So there, there, were, there were enough under the bilingual program. Under this current program, they've just farmed out everywhere and there's not enough to cover it. And run-ins, uh, are you so convinced that you wouldn't have better results if you did have the kind of tra teacher training and I, I, quality I think, instruction that perhaps Mr. Rosales is talking about here? Well, I think there's a lot of evidence because, remember, even though 227 passed as the law in California, a lot of school districts have resisted the law, have dragged their heels in implementing it. In fact, one comparison case which the supporters of bilingual always used to bring up there was Oceanside down near San Diego, which most strictly followed 227 and completely eliminated bilingual education once the initiative passed. Right next to Oceanside, there's a neighboring district called Vista, which supporters of bilingual said had a very strong bilingual program. They kept half their students in bilingual education using waivers. They did everything to strengthen their bilingual program in the last two years. It's a district of the same size of Oceanside, the same demography, same type of students. Oceanside's test scores doubled. Last year, Vista's test scores went down for immigrant students. So if two districts which are very similar, one of them goes English-oriented English immersion and has huge increases in test scores, the other school district stays with bilingual as much as possible and shows a decline in test scores. I think the evidence is there. But the evidence from your perspective, Ruben Rosales, is in Pittsburgh you're hurting. We're hurting. We're, ha we're having a crisis mode. We've had kids retained. And I'm not just saying this because it's my opinion. We've had the state and federal agency come in and prove this. And the kids have been retained. They've been hurt. They've been held back. They've dropped out. Uh, so it's a crisis mode. And, that, and this is an indication of what's happening statewide. And you've got to keep in mind that if you have a school following it to the letter of the law, I bet you that there are some services for there that is not happening throughout the, the, the state of California. What about that argument, though, that you had this whole wave of immigrants who came here, they didn't have bilingual education, they had to learn the, they had to learn the English language. Um, or if they didn't, then they were lost. And a lot of them did well, and, you know, it was kind of a Darwinian thing, you know, it, but... but in other words, that argument has been used and often is Oh, used. yeah, and, I've, and believe me, I've heard it. I, I think that you got to, first of all, think of the timing and where we are in society. At those times, 
education. You can probably get by with a high school education and go on and work in some trade and become successful. In today's world, you need beyond high school to be successful. So we have a choice. Either we educate these kids now and deal with them, or we're going to deal with them later when they become adults. So to succeed in today without some support, it's going to be difficult for them to get through high school and to go on to college. They need some support. They need some basic services. They need equal access to education. And you have access to join us here. You have uh, equal opportunity. In fact, we invite you to do so. If it's between 6 and 7, it means we're live and we welcome your calls. If you want to weigh in here on bilingual education or if you have a question you'd like to ask either of the guests, please do so. We're at 1-800-94-BAY-TV. ought to do a much better job ensuring that every child speak English. Having said that, though, I would also say that English only is a formula for no sales in a global economy. That's Lane Easton, who, of course, is superintendent of public instruction, talking about this. And since she brings up the global economy, English only, uh, she's got a point there, Ron Unz. We're moving into a global, I mean, you made your fortune in this global economy, and, and indeed, we're... Uh, very mindful of multiculturalism now as never before, particularly in some ways because of globalization. Doesn't this have to be factored into instruction and language learning? Oh, certainly. In other words, I, I work in Silicon Valley, and obviously there's so much international trade concerned with technology and issues like that. The world is a much smaller place than it used to be. And in fact, I think it's a very good thing if children in our schools learn additional important world languages at a young age. Languages like Chinese, like German, like Spanish. But the truth is, English is far and away the most important of these languages. English is not now and never has been America's official national language. But over the last 10 or 20 years, it's become the entire world's unofficial international language. It's the language of science, it's the language of technology, it's the language of business. And I think the most important things for our schools to do is ensure that young children are taught English as quickly as possible once they start school. And under 227, that really is the law in California. On the other hand, Ruben Rosales, I suppose you can make the case, here we are now living in a world in California where whites are the demographic minority, where there are more and more Hispanics, where Spanish is, uh, se habla espanol, all over the state of California. Um, I mean, it's become a very important language. So what does that mean in terms of bilingual education? Maybe you could argue that Caucasian kids and Asian kids and Native Americans and African Americans and so forth, they should also be learning Spanish. I mean, maybe they should be learning Haitian languages as well since we're on the Pacific Coast, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that as you look and you want to be... I'm not trying to be flip about this. No, I understand no, no. what I'm saying. I, I understand. Yeah. I, and I think that, you know, if you're thinking in terms of the future of California, I mean, the future is now. You can look around and you can see that you need to speak different languages to, to be able to have access to even just basic needs here in, in, our, in our cities. Uh, but I think it's pretty ethnocentric to sit there and say that English is the most important language. You know, I think you ought to look at what's happening in our communities. And, I, and I, I understand there's a concern globally, but I'm concerned about what's happening right now here in my community and what's happening in California. And right now with this 227, what has happened is it has given people an anti-immigrant sentiment. I mean, even in my, again, going back to Pittsburgh, students are being, they have been, uh, put in, you know, in timeout and put in trouble for using Spanish, not in the classroom, but in the playground, but in the, in the cafeteria. And all that is because they, they're, they're trying to interpret the law. They're trying to interpret 227. And so there's this anti-immigrant sentiment. Sure doesn't say anything in 227 about putting people in timeout for using Spanish. <laughs> well, that's the way I read the bill. It's, it's, well, and that's, that's, that's my whole point, is that the essence of this law has been created. And the way it's being interpreted, I, I would argue that I think more schools are trying to interpret the law by the letter of the law and finding that they're mis making mistakes and violating the kids' civil rights. And you think that's because it's a poorly written law, don't you? I think so. Yeah. I think it's poorly written. Yeah. I think that, you know, you, if you think we about it... this 227 well, fight it, all over again. If, here, if you, know. you can ask any district that try to interpret that and try to implement it, the ones that have been successful or in, under Ron's definition of successful, are ones that had a strong bilingual program and they knew what services needed, the basic services need to be there. If you look at school districts throughout the that are in disarray, they're still trying to interpret what parental waivers. I have, I'm, in a, I'm in a district right now where parental waivers have not been given for three years. Well, Ron, aren't you trying to, are you trying to replicate the same law? In, in, are, are you guys the standard bearers here for Arizona and Colorado and these other states who are moving in the same direction? Well, I wasn't really involved in the Colorado effort, and to be honest, they really didn't do a very good job, so there's not going to be any initiative on the ballot in Colorado. It went down. I thought there was going to be another one coming up, though. No, you know? in two years' time, yeah. maybe, or something like that. And, you know, I'm actually working with people to help that. But there's even talk in New York and Massachusetts. Right. Oh, exactly. And in Arizona, actually, in about a month and a half, the people of Arizona will be voting on a clone of 227, which seems to have a lot of popular support there. 
I really think the initiative is fairly solidly written. In other words, it simply requires that when children enter public school in California, unless, if they don't already know English under normal circumstances, they should be placed in intensive sheltered English immersion programs to teach them English and other subjects as quickly as possible. And once they know enough English to do regular work, they should be put in regular classes. All right, we want to hear from someone from uh, uh, your uh, side of the street, Ruben. We've got Liz from Pittsburgh joining us. Hi, Liz. Hi. My You're on the air. Hi. Hi. My, my question is to Mr. Nunn, if only, he's only talking about one school district in the whole state of California, and I'd like to know how many school districts are, su are success successful in California, and obviously it's only one school district that he's talking about. Can he answer that question for me? Well, no, that, test, scores, very, test scores are generally up. Well, the, they're not, not only a little bit. If we look at over a million immigrant students in the state of California, it's about 1.2, 1.3 million in elementary school. Of all those students, the average increase in test scores in two years is 40 percent. In other words, the average mean percentile test score of over a million immigrant students went up 40 percent. In Oceanside, they went up 100 percent. And there are a lot of school districts, for example, that kept their bilingual programs where the increases were zero or five percent or ten percent. But the statewide average is 40 percent. And anybody who deals with educational reform knows that a 40 percent increase in test scores in two years is nothing short of remarkable. Unless people are teaching to the test and unless, well, Liz, <laughs> well, you, you have a response to that? Well, obviously it's not happening in Pittsburgh. Um, I'd like to know how many school districts that are having the same problem as we are. And well, obviously... I have to admit, I don't know too much about the Pittsburgh school district in particular, and I can check. If I'd known ahead of time, I well, could Ruben, check. Well, Ruben, do you know? Are there Actually, I, I happen to have the federal investigation Just happens report. to have some uh, data with them there. No, I mean, test scores are really the interesting thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, the test scores haven't gone up in our community. What about other districts? Are other districts suffering like Pittsburgh? I think so. I think, I, I mean, I... Think so or know so? I know so. I mean, I'm in touch with parents throughout the community, and that's what's happening is you're having uh, a lot of schools that are basically trying to gear up for this test. Everything is for the test. So I would think if test scores went up, there's several variables that you have to look at, not just was it bilingual ed or no bilingual ed. I would say there's a lot of variables. What's happening with the instruction? Well, teaching phonics and, you know, all kinds of stuff, like we said earlier. Uh, Evie from Fremont is our next caller. Hi, you're on the air. Evie. Yes. Join us. You're on the air. Yes. Hi. Yes. Good evening. I'm Hi. seeing from the perspective of an elementary school teacher. I've taught in California for 20 years, and I'm very familiar with the bilingual program, having been in bilingual schools. The children that I've had in my class from other countries, including Mexico, um, have spoken, that have come in knowing no English, have spoken perfect English and are writing and reading very well at the end of my uh, year. The ones who are in the bilingual program, all their test scores are lower. It also segregates the kids in school. The bilingual children hang out in a corner of the playground by themselves for six, seven years. They do not speak to any of the other children in school. And I do not see where it is, uh, it is uh, a good program in any sense of the word. Well, there's some uh, observations from the trenches, the teaching trenches. Ruben Rosales? Well, again, from the trenches of the parents and the students, you'll see that uh, there's segregation going on now with 227. And that was one of the findings in our report, that the kids were being pulled up, trying to interpret, again, 227. The kids were pulled out of the classroom for a half hour a day and put in a special classroom. So there's segregation going on now. It's not, it hasn't changed with 227. If that's the case. Ron Unz, want to weigh in here? Well, I, I think what that particular teacher said is exactly what I've heard from so many different teachers and parents. And that's why there were protests many times against bilingual education. The whole effort we were involved in with 227 began when I re read a series of articles in the LA Times about a group of immigrant Latino parents in downtown Los Angeles who started a public boycott of their local elementary school because it refused to teach the children English. Now, sometimes bilingual activists have encouraged parents to protest 227. And in fact, in Oceanside, the district we're talking about, there were a lot of protests against Ken Noonan for being so strict as interpretation of 227, eliminating all the bilingual classes. And he got a lot of flack. But once his test scores started going up so rapidly, suddenly all the parents became very happy. And I would think in most of the districts around California that are strictly interpreting 227, the increase in test scores will make the parents very happy. Would that make you very happy? Let's just be hypothetical for a minute, Ruben uh, Rosales. If the test scores went up in Pittsburgh, 
Would that make you concede to Mr. Unz that maybe bilingual, uh, dropping bilingual education is part of the reason and you'd be ready to whoop it up with him and the rest <laughs> of these people? Well, I think Pittsburgh is probably the worst example you could cite because they did not implement the program at all. And so if you're looking at, you know, comparing it, that's the, probably the worst case scenario. So if you think in terms, and you got to keep in mind, proponents of bilingual ed are not saying teach my kids only in Spanish. They're not saying, you know, I only want my kid to learn that language and I don't want them to learn English. They're saying very much, I want my kid to learn English. All I right, want them a, to be effective. Another teacher on here. Let's try to get her in. Teresa from Antioch, join us on Take Issue. You're on the air. Welcome. Hi. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here listening and I am just furious listening to the comments made by Ron Unz, made by other teachers. As a former teacher of Pittsburgh um, and a bilingual educator, I just cannot imagine someone thinking that bilingual ed is not good for those newcomers, those kids who speak no English, those kids who really struggle in an English-only classroom. Um, it's amazing how you might have someone, you know, raw nuns. I can't, I can't even imagine having someone, a new, a child, I'm just so angry, I can't even imagine, I can't even speak. But, um, well, I'll tell you what, let's take your comments. Ron Unz, you, 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 one of your children, or you yourself as a child, uh, imagine suddenly you go to uh, Lower Slobovia and you have to learn Slobovian. Or I mean, would you want help? Wouldn't you want whatever help would be available to you? But that's the whole thing. In other words, I've known a lot of people who moved to other countries when they were young children, or people who've come to America as immigrants, and all of them agree the only way you can learn a language is to be immersed in that language. And that way you learn it quickly. And once you've learned it, you can do well in school. Now, let me hear from Teresa sure. quickly to that point. Teresa? Well, I mean, I can understand how, that, how people would see that. But, you know, you also have to take into account that you do have, I'm sorry, Pittsburgh, we did have and still have very qualified teachers who know what they're doing, be clad or not be clad certified. And we do a very good job. And every, the minute something goes wrong, who's blamed? It's the teachers. When in, when in reality, the person that should be trained or the, the people that should be blamed are the administrators who are not providing the, the needed um, support that the kids and the teachers need. All right, with that brick bat at administrators, we're going to have to close uh, that this segment, but it's certainly been an enlightening one. I want to thank Ruben Rosales, thank Ron Unz, thank you, Teresa, thank the others who called in.